Greetings, friends, and welcome to another ministry of the Victory Hour. This ministry is brought to you by the Lord's people at Clavel Assembly in Foster, Rhode Island. My name is Jim Gallagher. I'm the pastor at Clavel Assembly. We are not part of the Assemblies of God. No, no, and no. <laughs> we use the word assembly because there is no such word as church in the Bible. The Greek word is ekklesia, and it means a called out assembly. It is the assembly of the elect. That's what the word church, when you see in your Bible the word church, it's ekklesia, and it means a called out assembly. At kaleo, called out assembly. It is an assembly of people who have been called out. Called out by who? By God. That's predestination. He's called his chosen from before the foundation of the world. They are the called out ones. They are the called out assembly, the assembly of the elect. Elect, those that God has chosen. Election doesn't mean we choose God. Election means he chooses us. We don't elect God. God elects us. And we're talking about predestination today. As well, we should. We could talk about that every day, and it's deserving of it. But there's other stuff in the Bible, too. So I want to finish Ephesians 1 today. That's what I want to do. Finish Ephesians 1. Oh, by the way, so we're not part of the assemblies of God. We're not charismatic. We're not Pentecostal. Those things passed away in the first century before the coming of Christ in 70 AD. When he came in the glory of his father, he said, what in the world are you talking about? <laughs> like, I get it. I get it. I was thinking like you were for most of my Christian life. When we're going to do a series starting at the new year, we'll do start a series on the return of Jesus Christ, the parousia. And you're just going to be blown away and shocked if you haven't been exposed to these things. But we're going to go straight from the Word of God. That's the source of our doctrine. But let me just set that aside. We're talking about election and predestination and Ephesians 1. And I'm saying that there's no such word as a, a, a church in the Bible. I know you see it in your English versions. I have it in my King James Bible. But the Greek word means a called out assembly, an elect assembly, a chosen gathering of people that he's called. Jerry Farwell, well, Merrill Simon wrote a book entitled Jerry Farwell and the Jews. That's the name of the book. Jerry Farwell and the Jews. Merrill Simon was a rabbi. Not a messianic rabbi. He was a, a Jewish man. Held to Judaism. And he wrote the book, Jerry Farwell and the Jews, to prove to the Jewish community, hey, we can use these dispensational people to our advantage, and that's exactly what they're doing. You're being played like a fiddle for the Zionist cause. You're being played like a fiddle for fake Israel, fake Israel in the Middle East. Well, at any rate, Merrill Simon says, Now you, Jerry Fowell, you declare as a dispensationalist. That we, the Jews, are God's chosen people. And you better believe it. I'm a dispensationalist. I believe it. You know, literal hermeneutic of God's word. <laughs> well, that's another story. We have a little series on hermeneutics. You ought to go back and see that. Biblical hermeneutics. So the rabbi thought to take advantage of Jerry Falwell. You say, Jerry, that we Jews are God's chosen people, then how is it that you call yourself, as the church, the assembly of the elect? Now, do you get the rabbi's question? The question is, if you, as a dispensationalist Christian Zionist, call us unbelieving Jews God's chosen people, then how can you, as a church, call yourself the assembly of the elect? 
I thought we were the assembly of the elect. I thought we were the assembly of God's people that he's chosen. How can you say you're the assembly of God's people that uh, God has chosen? Because the rabbi knows that the meaning of the word church is the assembly of the elect. You're saying we're the assembly of the elect as the Jews. So how can you be the assembly of the elect? If we are God's chosen people, then how can you be the church? He's really asking that. The rabbi was no dummy, but I know who the dummy was. <laughs> I shouldn't say that, but boy, did he give a dumb answer, Jerry Fowler. So he responds, and by the way, this, this is a Q&A. The whole book is Q&A. Rabbi asks a question, Jerry Fowler answers. Now, the rabbi is submitting these questions in writing so they can be pondered upon, thought upon. An answer can be given, it can be honed, it can be edited, adapted, and reach its finalized form, and then you ship it off to the rabbi. That's how the book was done. So it's very thoughtful and careful. It's all writing. So when Jerry Fowler was asked, how can you call yourself the Assembly of the Elect? When we're God's chosen people. And Fowler's answer. I've got the book. Right over my book bookcase over there, which you can't see. It's out of sight, past that door. His answer was, well, nowhere in the Bible is the church called the assembly of the elect. Like, I don't know what you're talking about. What? The word church, the Greek word translated church, ecclesia, means the assembly of the elect. The rabbi is asking a very succinct, spot-on question that has great importance. If you say we're God's chosen people, then how can you be the assembly of the elect? Does God have two chosen people? And Fowell says, oh, nowhere am I aware of the church being called the assembly of the elect. Well, yeah, because that's the meaning of the word. Nowhere do I call a car an automobile. Why should I have to say that? It is an automobile. So Jerry Fowler was playing dumb because he was the chancellor of Liberty University. Don't tell me he didn't know the meaning of the word ecclesia. So he's playing stupid. And the rabbi, well, that's how he's going to play it. I'm okay with you being stupid. So we're God's chosen people, and you're not. You're just some church thing. You just remember that. And, and well, well we're, in, we're, in, we're on the same page. Farewell can shake hands with the rabbi. <laughs> Amen, brother. And the rabbi turns around, he rolls his eyes and says, what a dope. But if his people are going to swallow that, we'll go with that, because we don't want any competition as the Jewish people. We're God's chosen people. Now, let me just wipe all of that off the table and say, those who believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of a living God, they are the assembly of the elect. They are God's chosen people. Nobody else is. We're the Israel of God in Christ. The Jews that believed in the day of Pentecost and received Christ as their Savior, they walked in the faith of their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The Jews that murdered Christ and denied him, they did not walk in the faith of their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They were unbelieving branches that would be broken off and cast into the fire. The true Israel was where the physical, biological descendants from Abraham that believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. That was the continuation of, the continuation of true Judaism being fulfilled in the new covenant, which now they're called Christians. And the mystery of the gospel was that the Gentiles, by receiving the same Hebrew Messiah, are grafted into the commonwealth of Israel and join that true Israel, become a part of that true Israel before they were not a people. Now they also are the people of God. Before they were outside the commonwealth of Israel. Now they're partakers and are fellow citizens in the commonwealth of Israel. That's Ephesians 2 and 3. Christian Zionism and dispensationalism is built on a corrupt foundation. 
It destroys theology. It destroys eschatology. I know that's what everybody, where everybody's at. I had to close my comments down because there's so many dispensationalists that can't handle what I'm saying, and it just becomes a nonstop hate fest, which I don't care. You know, you can say what you want about me, but I'm not going to let like ridiculous charges like I don't know what I'm talking about go unchallenged, and I can't be answering everybody and their brother particularly when they, you know, got a bullseye on me and they're coming in by the dozens and eventually the hundreds or the thousands if this channel goes long enough, and I do. <laughs> so I, now shut the comments down. I can't, I can't not answer, but I don't have time to answer. I'm a pastor, an elder, a husband, a father, and I have a secular job as well. Make YouTubes. Do two sermons on Sunday, Sunday morning service, Sunday evening service. We have a Wednesday prayer meeting and Bible study. I lead that. Yeah, I'm somewhat busy. So I don't have time for that nonsense. But if anybody wants to raise a question about anything I've said on YouTube, you can email me. You have to mean business. If you're not serious about asking the question and it isn't worth you emailing me, then I don't care to answer you. But if you're serious, you have a serious question. I don't care. You can be really upset with me. Go ahead. That's fine. I'm happy to have the question or the opposition or whatever, you, you know, be respectful. Because if you're just going to be disrespectful, I, you know. But if you want to respectfully disagree with me, you can. Or if you want a question, info at clavelassembly.com. That's my email address, info at clavelassembly.com. Yeah, keep an eye on the clock here. How long have I been going? Whew. Or you can write to me, the Victory Hour, P.O. Box 222, Foster, Rhode Island, 02825. Or you can write it, make it to Clavel Assembly, same address, P.O. Box 222, Foster, Rhode Island, 02825. Happy to hear from you, one way or another. Whether you're happy or mad, glad or sad. But you got to take a little bit of effort. I can't leave those comments open. I don't. I, I feel obligated to answer everyone. I, I just can't do that. And I can't hire people to do it for me. We're not that kind of assembly. Uh, believe it or not, what we teach isn't so popular nowadays. The myth of Christian Zionism and dispensationalism. Yeah, that's what's popular now. Johnny come lately. Well. <clears throat> We got to get to Ephesians. So we're the assembly of the elect, which is to say we're God's chosen people, which is to say God has predestined and elected us to be fellow citizens in the commonwealth of Israel if we have believed that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of a living God. That's salvation, that's regeneration, it's by election. And Ephesians 1 teaches this. And I have been explaining to you last time, or last two victory hours, really. I was in Mexico and I was given the job to teach a Bible study to some men in Mexico. We we're on a little missionary trip. And I had verse 5 of Ephesians 1 as my text. Now, this was like over 30 years ago. But I remember it like it was yesterday. And verse 5 struck me so wonderfully and beautifully because I realized verse 5 is the what, uh, what, how, and why of the gospel. The what, how, and why of salvation, the what, how, and why of our identity as regenerated believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's all bound up in one verse, Ephesians 1, 5. Not that it's not found in other places, it's everywhere, but this is just so succinct. So I was talking about that last time. Let me just remind you of what it says. I'll read verse 4 for some context here. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. Now, Paul's writing to the Christians at Ephesus, and he says that he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. He didn't say that we chose him, he said that he chose us. Let's keep that the way that it's given. According as he hath chosen us in him, when did he do this? Before the foundation of the world. Well, that was before we were even born. Yes, it was. Before we had done right or wrong. Yes, it was. Even before we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. We were predestined. 
to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Those that do, they were predestined to that end. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy. So when we're made Christians, when we're made followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we're chosen to eternal salvation, it's to an end that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. That's the work that God is doing in his people that he regenerates. It's true. It's an ongoing work because we're in a spiritual battle. We have to war against our own flesh and temptation from without. Nevertheless, this verse is true, which leads us into the next verse. Having verse 5, remember what, how, and why. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. All right. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children, what are we? We're the adopted children of God. Who's the we? Well, the believers. He's writing to the believers at Ephesus. So these are regenerated believers, people that believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of a living God, that he died on the cross for our sins, was buried and was raised again the third day according to the Scripture. He was our substitute. Our Lord and our God. So what are we? As believers, we're the adopted children of God. How did we become the adopted children of God? Because not everybody is a Christian. So how is it that we became Christians? By Jesus Christ. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children, that's what we are, by Jesus Christ. That's how we get that way. It is through Jesus Christ and his shed blood. Because without that shed blood, no one can be a child of God. This whole idea, this nonsense they put out like, oh, all the human beings on the earth, we're all children of God. No, we're not. No. We may be the creation of God. We're here by God's ordination and power and sovereignty in a very, very loosely non-biblical metaphoric sense. We're all the children of God that way, but that's not how the scriptures uses the phrase children of God. The children of God is meant to identify God's elect people, the ones he's chosen and made his own and brought into his family through regeneration. Having, so what are we? We're the adopted children. How do we get that way? How do we? How were we saved? How could we have our sins forgiven? By Jesus Christ, through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, substitutionary atonement, a vicarious atonement. So what are we? The adopted children. How did we become the adopted children? By having our sins forgiven through Jesus Christ. Well, then why is that true for us? Because that's not true of everyone. If we've been predestinated to be the adopted children, that means there's other people that were not predestinated to be his adopted children. Correct. Not everybody is covered under the blood of Christ. The blood of Christ is able to forgive an infinite number of worlds and universes and an infinite number of people, but there aren't an infinite number of world and universes and an infinite number of people. There's a finite number. But be that as it may, the blood of Christ could save an inestimable amount of people. That's not the problem. The, there's no problem with the power of the blood of Christ. What that, what's at issue is the efficacious application of that blood to produce regeneration in the person. That is limited to the ones he has chosen. You can't believe in election without believing in limited atonement. You're kidding yourself. So what are we? We're the adopted children of God. How is that legally possible? Because where sin is like everyone else, through Jesus Christ, by being covered with the blood of Christ, by God's grace through faith. And how is it? Why is it 
that we have that privilege of regeneration and predestination? Why did he choose us? Well, that's the last part of the verse. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children, what we are, by Jesus Christ, that's how we got that way, to himself, according, here's why, here's why we're in that position, according to the good pleasure of his will. Yes. Right there. That's the answer. Why someone says, did, if I'm a believer, and you're saying I've been predestinated, but my neighbor is not a believer because he wasn't chosen before the foundation of the world, why should God choose me? Was I any better than him? Nope. I don't have to know you, and I know the answer to that question. No. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. Man drinks in iniquity like water. Even Job's friends knew that. And they weren't such great counselors. But why have, have the elect been predestined? Here's why. Because it was the good pleasure of God's will to do that for them. Someone says, well, that's not a reason. It's the best reason in the world. God chose to do it, and so it came to pass. But why did he choose me, you can ask? Because he wanted to. Well, why did he want to? Well, we don't know the answer to that. We do know that every single person that has been that has received Jesus Christ as their Savior and has been born again and made a child of God, an adopted son, through his shed blood. Every single one of them, myself included, were sinners just like everybody else. We were not, in, we did not deserve this grace. Our sins deserve judgment and wrath, just like anybody else's. But Christ bore our sins and carried our sorrows. And the Lord chose me, not because I deserved it. He chose me because it pleased him to do it. That doesn't explain the why within the context of God's mind. But God hasn't revealed his mind in regards to the why, other than to say it pleased him to do it. And that will have to suffice. Now, I have to say this. I don't think God does anything arbitrarily. Like, ah, well, every other person. Uh, I'll, I'll like them, whoever they are, whatever they ought to come. No. Nothing like that or even close to it. Every single person that has received Christ as their Savior and been, been forgiven of their sins and made children of the living God that's happened because God planned before he ever created the world for that specific particular individual who did not exist at that time. His parents didn't exist. In fact, no human beings existed before he ever got everything rolling here in creation. He knew Jim Gallagher. Well, of course, my response would be, well, then why did he choose me? because it pleased him to do so. And that's all I know. I know I didn't deserve it. There's none that understand it. There's none that seeketh after God. Well, I had to be part of that number. We must make peace with how God reveals himself, not how we demand him to be. We can't be twisting his word to make him conform to the image of our wild imaginations, which we think are more just than what God has revealed about himself. I'm sorry, I'm not going to play that game. That was from my evangelical past many, many, many years ago. I'm not going back. I'm not going back to that rebellious worldview. The Lord's taught me a thing or two, and I've been humble. Lesson learned. Now, you do the same. If you haven't learned that lesson, just, you know, it's a matter of faith. The Lord says it. It must be true. And I believe it must be right and just because it's what God has done. 
What is the matter with that? Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace. See, not to the praise of the glory of our free wills. No. Now, I didn't choose me because he looked down into in the future and says, well, if I give Jim the gospel, eventually he may be stubborn at first, but if I press it hard enough, he will receive me. So I'm going to predestine him to salvation based on my seeing how he would choose me. So really, God is predestin predestinating us and choosing us because he saw, well, we were choosing him first. No. 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 It's not what the Bible says anywhere. He hath chosen us to the praise of the glory of his unmerited favor, his grace. It's not us. Not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. To the praise of the glory of his grace. We're not his justice. Well, Jim was a little bit better. He's, he's a rotten, no good bum with sin. But if I give him half a chance, eh, he'll get around to doing the right thing and believing on my son. So I give him a little credit and I'll save him. No, to the praise of the glory of his grace. Now, if it was to the praise of the glory of his justice, I would be damned with the balance of mankind. Because that's what I would deserve. The election is to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted he hath made us accepted in the beloved. We didn't make ourselves, and then he accepted us because we were acceptable. No! He hath made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood. Oh, look at the time. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Oh, I thought I'd finish this today. I'm not going to. Oh, I shouldn't be exasperated by that. I don't mind talking about election. No, I don't. Say, Pastor, we got more to cover in Ephesians 1. We're not done with it. Now, I don't know what to do. So, uh, Thursday, well, that's the last victory hour before Christmas. I was thinking of doing something related to Christmas. Well, maybe I will. I know that's what it may, I'll just have to do that. And I'll come back to Ephesians 1 after Christmas. Uh, Christmas Day is on a Monday when we usually release a victory hour. So I'm not going to release anything that day because, well, people aren't going to be seeing it during Christmas. So, you know, take a break. But that Thursday, the Thursday after Christmas, we'll be back and I'll come right back to Ephesians where we left off. And like I've been telling you, the beginning of the year, um, I don't know if on the first broadcast, now, not broadcast, whatever you call it here on YouTube, but our first program for the new year, uh, you know, I don't know if it'll, we'll go right to this new subject. Maybe we will. If not, we'll be within a week or two. But I think right away, um, I want to talk about prophecy, the parousia, the second coming of Christ. Wow, wow, what a story that's going to be. But I got to finish this stuff on election. Uh, this, this series on election... I started it before, took a long break. I'm not going to continue to do part five, six, seven, eight, because people will start dropping off when you just start adding numbers. So I'm kind of like separating them. And I'm just talking about Ephesians here, predestination. It's a great subject. You say, well, why do you love talking about it so much? I understand the question. If you're not used to it and it scares you, I can see why you'd think that, because I used to think that. Let me tell you something. When you receive this thing by faith, without being able to fully explain it, God does something for you in here. You're learning a lesson that's so valuable. But I'm out of time. I, I guess maybe I can talk about that next time as well. So, um, after Christmas, that Thursday, we'll get right back to Ephesians. And this Thursday, I'll have a few thoughts to share with you about um, what everybody calls Christmas. And I hope it'll be something that's uh, profitable for you. But look, I've got to go. My time's up. 
This is Jim Gallagher reminding you in the words of our blessed Lord and Savior, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free.